So I, I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to complex fractal dimensions. And please stop me whenever you want. I mean, that is <laughs> tell me when I should stop. Because <laughs> I'm not known to stop on time. <laughs> um, but I don't care. I mean, it's, so in fact, the first few slides will be enough to understand the intuition. And that's probably what you should remember from this talk. All right, so this is a, an, old, uh, an old slide uh, where you have somebody playing a harp or a fractal stream, a fractal harp, and uh, below is a cloud of complex dimensions, really. Um, so it's like a rain of complex dimensions coming from the sky. And the complex dimension, as we shall see, gives you a lot of information, not the whole information, but a lot of information about the fractality of the object and about its nature. All right, so if I were to give like a full talk, which I will not, I will talk about all these topics, but uh, so Minkowski content, which you probably know, notion of Minkowski dimension of box dimensions. Uh, we'll talk about here is called fractal string, which is a one dimensional case. And then the higher dimensional case where now we have a complete, well, not complete, but quite well-developed theory of complex fractal dimensions, even in higher dimensions. In fact, now we're doing metric measure spaces that I'm not going to talk about. And so there are two notions, the distance and tube that are functions to give you more or less the same information. Sometimes it's more convenient to work with one or the other. And uh, there is a notion of relative fractal term, which I will not discuss, and hopefully I'll talk a little bit about the end. Uh, definition of fractality and very singular, what I call hyperfractal, maximally hyperfractal. Okay, so let me skip this. Um, but the, the relations, there are many relations between various areas of mathematics, of course, mathematical physics, harmonic analysis, spectral geometry, number theory, of course, and uh, data functions everywhere. And, um, Etc. So complex analysis. And now I'm thinking also of several complex variables, not just one, but I will not talk about it. So, oh, sorry. Uh, yes. So some of the main references. There is a, uh, an earlier book with uh, Michael van Parsenhausen. In fact, they were the first one, Fractal Geometry and Number Theory, at the very beginning of 2000. Then uh, a larger one in 2006. And the, the second edition is the larger is in 2013, if I remember correctly. So this was mostly the one-dimensional theory or very special higher-dimensional geometry. But uh, many of the techniques developed there have been useful in the higher dimension case, in the higher dimensional case. And now, uh, in 2009, I got the idea of how to define the way I really wanted the zeta function in higher dimension. So we developed with uh, Goran Radunovic and Darko Dubrinic, both from the University of Zagreb. Actually, Goran is one of my students. Or the Darko was really his PhD advisor, but he asked me to be a kind of honorary advisor. And uh, we wrote uh, this book, Fractal Data Function and Fractal Drums, where the theory is expanded in the detail. And, and the subtitle is Higher Dimensional Theory, Complex Dimensions. And we have about 10 different papers now on this. Some go beyond this, but it's okay. So, um, this is a book I'm writing. Actually, I wrote two years ago already, but uh, my daughter got very sick. I stopped it at that point, but um, I'm coming back to it. And uh, a paper for a conference that was organized for my birthday two years ago. And finally appeared, an overview of complex fractal dimensions. So if you want to have an overview of the theory, you might want to read this paper or the future. But, um, so, um, no, let me, ah, so I promised them to, so I'm an editor for that journal, but uh, not particularly, but there is a special issue on fractal geometry analysis in microphysics. My cross promise that you advertise it, so this is uh, an amateur editor for it. 
And uh, so if you are interested in submitting a paper, a good quality paper on related structures from many points of view, any, any point of view really, provided the paper is good, then please submit it to that journal mathematics. Or you can write me and I'll tell you what. I mean, there is a detailed web page. But, uh, and I think the deadline is in April, end of April. All right, so this, these are the slides I want you to remember, the rest we can forget, because I don't have time to talk about it in detail. So uh, in the theory of complex dimensions, uh, you can express various quantities, like the volume of the epsilon neighborhood of your object, which is say a fractal, or a fractal term, or something else. And uh, in this case, this is the volume of the epsilon neighborhood of A, A is a bounded set in Rn, and uh, you can write it, I'm writing the simplest form of it, as a, a sum of residue of a certain zeta function, that in this case the distance zeta function. No. no. So, and, uh, so this is the distance zeta function. We'll talk about it maybe a little bit more. And this is a sum of all the complex dimensions of certain powers epsilon, epsilon is out of closer to your fractal. And uh, right, and this is the residue of that zeta function. In case of simple form, you know, when you have multiple folds, you have a similar form, and it's more complicated. Sorry. Sorry? Omegas are a complex dimension. <coughs> and these are the folds of the zeta function, of a morphic conformation of the zeta function. And more generally, these are singularities of the zeta function. And uh, so this is what I was saying, these are the poles. And this is the epsilon neighborhood. And uh, this is the volume of the epsilon neighborhood, the back measure set. Or if you have a more, more general metric space, then this would be, you assume you have a suitable measure that relates well with the metric of the metric space. So you use that instead. Okay. So, uh, let me give you the example of the Cantor string, so that's a, or the Cantor set. You take the Cantor set in the real line in zero one set, and uh, this uh, the volume in this case is going to be given by the expression I gave you here. I, I show here, and the complex dimension are just on one line uh, with real part, a uh, vertical line. Real part of it is the dimension of the Cantor set up to a of three, whether you have Hausdorff or. Because it doesn't matter here, but in general it's in Cossie dimension, that we should say. And uh, plus i, n, n is a relative integer times 2 pi over log 3 equals the oscillatory theory of the representative set. And uh, in this case, there are two zeta functions. So there is the geometric zeta function, it's just the sum of the lengths of this Cantor set of the intervals that you delete at each stage of the construction of the Cantor set, sum of Lj to the s. And you, you count them with multiplicities. And so that's given by this expression, one over three to the s minus two, and that's why you get see the poles, meaning the zeros of that expression, give you exactly this complex dimension. And if you look at the distance zeta function, it's related in this way: two to the one minus s times one minus s times the geometric zeta function. That's a general formula. So pretty much in one dimension, one or the other. And in Sierpinski gas cap, you have a similar thing. You have oscillatory, you have what is called a multiplicatively periodic oscillation. So this is called it uh, logarithmic, uh, periodic oscillation. And the zeta function can be explicitly computed. Uh, the complex dimensions are 0, 1, and then something very similar to the Cantor set, a vertical line, but not with real part log of three over log two, and we have a discrete set uh, an arithmetic progression with a theory periodic between the same uh, two pi over log three. And uh, now the we do that with the carpet, etc. But the devil's staircase is a more interesting example because that's really one of the things that motivated me to think about these notions a long time ago when I read Mendelbrook's book. I found it fascinating, but the fractal geometry of nature. I mean, but uh, there were a lot of things. Well, there were no theorems, and there was a particular a definition of fractal, which 
for which you could immediately find a primary example. I mean, about knew about that. That's the devil's staircase, for instance. I mean, you can find other. That's the first one. And the devil's staircase, you know, it's just uh, the, the back canter curve, so it increases from zero to one monotonically. And um, it's, of course, a kind of a fractal. Well, it, it's not really. It, it is fractal, but uh, it has finite mass. It's rectifiable as a graph. And so, because it's rectifiable, it has dimension one, whether you take Minkowski, Hausdorff, or topological dimension, they all equal. But Mandelbrot was saying an object is fractal if it has dimension strictly greater than the uh, Hausdorff dimension, you were saying strictly greater than topological dimension, which is not the case here. And of course, everybody, whatever you do, want to call the fractal, everybody would agree that this has to be fractal. But what I call that a fractal is an object with geometry, I mean a geometric object, say, but more generally you know, dynamical system, etc. if it has at least one non-real complex dimension. And uh, at least one non-real complex dimension. So let's see what happens in this case. Well, in this case, the complex dimensions are 0, 1, and all the complex dimension of the Cantor set, log 2 over log 3 plus 2 pi n pi over log 3, but n is an integer. So what happens, it doesn't have complex dimensions which are non-real, a maximal dimension, 1, because that's intuitively because it, uh, it has finite length. So it's not fractal in this sense, in the most, uh, you know, in the largest real dimension. But it is subfractal because it has dimension, the same dimension as the Cantor set, complex dimension, and therefore non-real, uh, in dimension log 2 over log 3. So um, that's what I call fractality and, and reality. Just one question. Yes, please. If, if the fractal is random, like SMB, yes. that does Very good the world, the world does apply to you. Well, OK. So yes, it does apply. And very good question, because I modify my definition, the original definition, which I just gave you. Because of such examples, I mean, not necessarily SLE, but I have drawn a motion or any random example, uh, with um, uh, Ben Hamley in the 2004, I think we wrote an article about certain random fractal objects. And uh, we, we studied the complex dimension in this case, pointwise, which is much harder than the expectation value. And uh, then, uh, it, we could show that there exists a complex dimension in the usual sense up to a certain level, and then beyond that, by using central limit theorem, essentially. But beyond that, we didn't know if there was a confirmation. And my, my conjecture is that for most random fractal, it will not be meromorphic confirmation beyond a certain curve. Like, there will be a natural boundary. And uh, remaining, there are singularities accumulating along certain curves, say the vertical line or some other curve. And uh, so you might say, well, then it's not fractal because you cannot see the complex dimension beyond. But then I modify the definition and I say, well, an object is a fractal if it has singularities with the complex dimension, which are now viewed as singularities rather than just poles. Of a, of, a, of, a, of a geometric extension uh, accumulate. I mean, in such a way, there are singularities which are non-real. And uh, so what I expect, so they are more fractal in some ways. What I expect for random, random fractals, is that you would have accumulation of singularity of one certain curve. So this one is for random motion? For example, yeah. So I mean, it's not been proved. Yeah. It's not proved that. No, no, but I conjecture it's true. <coughs> And uh, I mean, I've, I've actually, a few weeks ago, I was giving a talk uh, for an audience of probability, and I promised to give open problem, and this was the most important one, give the open problem I wanted to emphasize. Uh, OK, so what is the intuition between notion of complex dimension? Uh, so these complex dimensions are complex numbers. Obviously, they have a real part, an imaginary part, d plus i tau. Uh, the principal one, those of maximal real part, coinciding with the complex with the Minkowski dimension of the object, uh, are you know to the right here, but there are there could be others also with real parts strictly less than that. And so the real parts anyway give you amply so you can imagine a, a wave, a geometric wave moving through the fractal. I use that image, but it's not quite correct. 
you should think that the wave moves through the scale, the space of scale that you're on. It's not exactly the same. And, uh, and the amplitudes of these, geomet of these waves, I call them geometric waves, uh, are the real part, or they are intimately connected with the real part. And the, and the frequencies of these geometric waves are intimately connected with the imaginary part. So that's where the physical or, or geometric meaning of these uh, complex dimensions are. And this so-called explicit formula, I gave you the example of a, a few slides ago, like this, or the, the first one. These are, of course, uh, in this case, these are oscillations these are, which are multiplicative. In a, you know, you could first make a change of variable, make them uh, additive, but uh, this is what the meaning of this uh, real part and imaginary part of the complex dimension. So you have, okay. So now I can uh, start the talk, but uh, as I said, I could stop here uh, for a short talk, which I think is enough, but please tell me whenever you want to. Uh, so these are just, I, I'll explain what these are, but these are just the distance function to a third fractal, like in this case, the Sierpinski carpet. Or if not the distance function, it's a power of the distance function. And we'll say the power, we'll see the power and the distance that are functions by the symbol. Power and okay, so now let's take a precise definition. So let's have A be a bounded set in Rn, anything, doesn't have even to be measurable. Take the epsilon neighborhood of A, which is the set of points within the space, which are within a distance less than epsilon from A. Sometimes you want to intersect with some other set and so on. This is the notion of relative fractal plan, which I won't have time to talk about, but it's very useful for many situations. And the theory, and the theory is about the imaginary analysis. Um, but let me just talk about A. Then you take the Minkowski content, so or the lower Minkowski content, upper one, that is you divide the volume of A epsilon, the, what I call V of epsilon before, <coughs> by some power of epsilon, epsilon to the n minus s, s is a real number here, not yet a complex number. And uh, and you see if this has a limit, it may not have a limit, but it always has a lower limit, and see when this happens. So it's the S dimensional lower and upper Minkowski content. And uh, then uh, you can define the, the box dimension of the Minkowski dimension, lower and upper, but it, you know, you have a kind of a phase transition where the upper Minkowski content is infinite to the left, and then zero to the right, and similarly for the for the lower Minkowski dimension, the, the lower box dimension. And uh, in general, they may be different, but if they go in the upper dimension, then you just say that, you, that the box dimension exists for the Minkowski dimension. Similarly, the, the set is, say, Minkowski non-degenerate if the upper Minkowski content is finite and the lower one is strictly greater than zero. So it's if that's not the case, you could change the gauge. Instead of working with power epsilon, epsilon to some power, you can change the gauge function, and, and then you can you know, define Minkowski degenerate with respect to that gauge. Um, okay. <coughs> if the <coughs> if the lower and the upper dimension other contents Coincide. <clears throat> if the lower and the upper Minkowski content coincide are not trivial, not zero or infinity. <clears throat> Coming from California, it's a little change of weather. <coughs> <coughs> then uh, you said that the set is Minkowski measurable. Okay. All right. So, for example, the Cutter set <coughs> is not Minkowski measurable, but it's Minkowski non degenerate. And this dimension is about 2 over 3. <coughs> and then you could talk about the A set. So, A is some positive number. 
and take the inverse power, okay? We create an integer. <coughs> and the dimension is 1 over 1 plus 1. And A is being cross symmetrical. Okay, just very simple example. So these are the oscillations <coughs> intrinsic to the Kemper set. But I forgot to say that the theory of complex dimensions it is a theory of oscillations. <coughs> then the, these are the this is the explicit formula for the, the volume of the epsilon and we can represent it this way graphically. <coughs> We can see the oscillatory nature of the, of the volume in the and the other underlying objects of the complex dimension. Okay. Right, so this is the distance to the Cambridge set. And the distance option. <coughs> and this is these are some powers or inverse powers. Symmetry for the carpet. <coughs> okay. Let's skip that. So, what is a fractal string? So, an ordinary string vibrating <coughs> is just uh, you have at one interval, and uh, the string is going to attach at the endpoint, for example, and vibrate. A uh, fractal string, they have infinitely many interval counted to many, vibrating independently of each other, <coughs> and fix it at the end point. So, <coughs> mathematically, you can just think of one open set bounded over finite lengths, and uh, you consider the Dirichlet equation on it. <coughs> Sorry, <I can't. coughs> So um, if you if you look at your open set, the uh, length of the connected component, that is of the intervals of which it's composed, the open interval, are the lengths Lj, are called Lj, and you count them with multiplicity. So with a counter set, you know the other lengths of each of the intervals you remove at each step of the construction. Mm -hmm. All right. So the geometric zeta function is just the sum of the lengths to the power of s, and uh, yes, um, you can associate to it. Let me skip. So, uh, so first, uh, the basic theorem, which I observed a long time ago, but we, for which we have a direct proof here in this, uh, in, the, in one of the our books, with Machia. Say the following, the geometric zeta function is holomorphic to the right of the upper Minkowski dimension. And uh, in fact, this is the best possible. It's not holomorphic to the left of it, strictly to the left of it. And uh, also, the, Z, the geometric zeta function is converging absolutely to the right of it, of the that upper Minkowski dimension. And it's not to the left of it. And so this is also the best bound possible. On form you have conversions of the absolute conversions of the geometric z function. And uh, so in particular you have a singularity <coughs> at the upper Minkowski dimension. That is if you tend from the right along the real axis or along some vertex, I mean some little cone like that, that is with vertex at the upper Minkowski dimension, then the z function blows up. Uh, this should so along the real axis it's real, but if if you go inside the complex plane, then you should take the model. So, uh, so the abscess of holomorphic continuation, which tells you how far you can holomorphically continue, is uh, exactly coinciding with the abscess of absolute convergence, which tells you how far you can converge abs absolutely. And uh, they both coincide, and they are equal to the upper Minkowski dimension. So it's the best possible situation. And, uh, okay, so this is true for any fractal string, except a single interval of some kind of tree. So, now let me talk about the distance set function. So, you have a bounded, open, uh, bounded set, uh, not open, 
in Rn, you fix delta. So delta is going to play, well, it's, it's not playing any role that it plays just fixed. It's, so it's given to you. I'll comment on that in a second. You take the distance data function, so you take the powers of the distance to A and raise to the power, so it's S minus N. S now is a complex variable, and uh, with real part large enough. We'll see how large. And again, you have this fixed delta. And you integrate over the delta neighborhood of A, of your part, of your part. And uh, so this function is singular to the left of n, n is the ambient dimension. And so what happens when you change delta? Uh, you get a function over some, some Kuban interaction of a, so like between the distance between two disks and uh, over to the epsilon neighborhood. And that's an entire function. So it, from the point of theory of complex dimension, it really doesn't matter. Uh, which delta you choose because the complex dimension will not change the pole of a possible neuronic extension and the residues will not change either. However, actually, I was giving a talk uh, two weeks ago at a conference and somebody asked a very interesting question can you perturb in terms of delta and get an expansion? And I think I can do that and I can get an expansion in terms of the zeros and maybe the poles as well. But of the, the, the distance function, so which would give a role for the zero. <coughs> this is a just, uh, I don't know. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, let's not, let's skip that, but uh, they, let me just say that there is a, in one dimension, the geometric zeta function and the, and the distance zeta function are related in, in this manner, but uh, let's just say it's 2 to 1 minus s over 1 minus s times the geometric zeta function, the distance zeta. I'm cheating you a little bit, this is a precise, but if you take the relative fractal term version of what I say, then it's correct. Right, so basically they give you the same information uh, in one dimension. So the complex dimensions are defined as the pole of the geometry zeta function, that was the original definition in one dimension. Now you do the same in higher dimension, the poles of neuromorphic confirmation when it exists of zeta, okay? Of course, you have to be precise, you have to say within which region you expand, if there is extension, etc. So you can talk about visible complex dimension. The poles of zeta A in some region U. Right. Uh, so, so you have the analogous, uh, the analogous theorem I was mentioning in one dimension, but now it's a little different. So zeta is holomorphic to the right of the upper box dimension, time. And uh, from the point of view of, of the convergence of the integral, viewed as a Dovec integral, the integral of the distance to the power epsilon, uh, this is optimal. That is, the upper box dimension is the abscissa of convergence of that, what I call Dirichlet type integral. You can show the abscissa of convergence exists, the such integrals, and it's equal to the upper box dimension. So that's fine. So this is perfect. Uh, from the point of holomorphic continuation, it's a little more delicate. If the dimension exists and d is strictly less than n, and the lower Minkowski constant is non-trivial, that is strictly greater than zero, then you have a singularity just as before at the upper Minkowski dimension of the zeta function. So in that case, the abscissa of holomorphic continuation, and I mean the abscissa of the holomorphic continuation and the abscissa of holomorphic of um, the abscissa of uh, convergence, of absolute convergence of the Lebesgue integral exists. I mean, uh, they both coincide with the upper Minkowski So, so but in general, the abscissa of convergence of the distance zeta function is equal to the upper Minkowski dimension. Under the additional assumption, then it also coincides with the abscissa of holomorphic continuation, uh, which is the Find at the infinimum of those alpha such that the zeta can be holomorphically continued to the right of alpha or real part of S greater than alpha. Okay. We don't know if these conditions that we have in the third part of the theorem are necessary. I suspect they are, but we don't have specific examples for this result. Okay.
Uh, let me give you a couple of examples uh, of, example of how to use this to understand the notion of Minkowski measurability. So for instance, if the upper Minkowski content is finite and the lower one is factor positive, then, well, you have always this inequality, but it's trivial if one is infinite and the other is zero. So, but, well, not completely zero. So you have the residue at D, the upper Minkowski dimension, is always between n minus d times the upper Minkowski constant and n minus d times the lower Minkowski constant. And so this value of the residue is independent of delta, as I mentioned earlier. For example, for the triadic tender set, you have strict inequalities for the different gasket, for the crushed snowflake, etc. You also have. Um, but if A is Minkowski measurable, then uh, the residue is exactly equal as a corollary, I can say, to n minus d times the Minkowski constant. So you have an intimate relationship between the residue of the function at the Minkowski, at the Minkowski dimension and the upper Min and the Minkowski constant across the edge. So, so you can define another zeta function, we call the tube zeta function, and it's defined in terms of this function, which is the volume of the T neighborhood with this positive. And so specifically is given by this integral from zero to delta. So again, there is a delta given. It doesn't matter which delta you choose, but you have to choose some. And uh, you integrate this function, the volume of AT times T to the S minus N. And then the minus one, I prefer to view it, viewing it as DT over T. This is the multiplicative R measure. It's the R measure on zero infinity on the multiplicative. That's the way you should see it. And you integrate from zero to delta. Again, if you change delta, nothing changes. I mean, from point over the complex dimensions. And you have one complex dimension over. Uh, there is a, a very simple relationship between the distance zeta function and the tube, and it's given by that function it involves delta. And you can deduce from it that provided d is less than n, then zeta a tilde, the tube, and zeta a, the distance zeta function, have the, the same meromorphic continuation. I mean, it has meromorphic continuation in some domain u, you can only if the other one has. And in that case, the poles within this region are the same. And the residues are the connected in you know, some simple. OK. Or more generally, the principal function. But let me skip this. Yeah. Yes. Excuse me. Yes. Maybe I five more yeah, yeah. comments. Let me close up by saying, uh, how, how much did you say? Maybe one five more. Five, five more comments. Five. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, in that case, let me skip. Yeah. Uh, I, I should say maybe that. Maybe what was it? There is a similar theorem to the one I mentioned earlier for the tube zeta function, but I cannot see it. It doesn't matter. Let's keep that. Yes. Okay, so let's uh, consider, for instance, let's assume a very simple situation where the tube, the volume of the tube, is t to the n minus d <coughs> times some constant m m because it's going to happen to be the Minkowski constant, plus big O of t to the alpha, where alpha is some positive number. OK. So assume that about the volume of the tube of A. Then A is Minkowski measurable. The dimension exists and is equal to D, that number D over there. The Minkowski constant exists. And so in other words, A is Minkowski measurable, as we said. That is equal to that constant m. And, uh, the axis of convergence of the zeta function, it's also true for the distance zeta function, is equal to d. And uh, moreover, zeta a as a, or zeta a tilde as a unique meromorphic continuation to at least this region here, real part of S greater than d minus alpha, that's half plane. And in this case, the pole S equals d is unique in that region. Simple, and the residue is equal to m. Okay. So this is for the tube, 
but we have a completely similar theorem provided d is less than n for the distance that our function with now the residue is n minus d times n. Okay. Let's look at another situation. So the volume of the t neighborhood is assumed is t to the n minus d times a periodic function of log of t inverse. Remember these are multiplicative oscillations, that's why make this change of variable. Plus big O of t to the alpha as t times to zero. So assume that. Then the Minkowski dimension exists is equal to d. The lower Minkowski constant is the minimum of g. The upper one is the maximum of g of that periodic function and the disk and they are two, you know, the uh, abscissa of convergence is equal to d. And furthermore, it has, so the tube zeta function has a unique normal extension to at least this region here, the same as before. And the set of all visible complex dimensions within this region uh, is simply given by this. So d plus two pi r k uh, over t, t is the period of the periodic function where k is in z. And this is like the Fourier transform of that period. The truncated Fourier transform of d, but let's not worry. And uh, okay, so in particular, g is non-constant, so the truly oscillatory case, then uh, this is not Minkowski measurable. Okay, it's not Minkowski measurable because the lower and the upper do not coincide. The upper, the lower and the upper Minkowski constant do not coincide as a result. And uh, let's just focus on this. The residue at d is equal to the mean value, to the mean of that periodic function, and the residue is strictly between the lower and the upper Minkowski Okay, the particular A is not Minkowski measure. Uh, under this assumption, one can show that there is a suitable notion of average Minkowski content. So the Minkowski content doesn't exist, but the average one exists. It's defined as a suitable Cesaro limit uh, of average a C0 logarithmic average of this quantity on the way of C0 over T onto the minus D. And the residue at D is equal to the average mean of the content. And it's also equal to the mean value of T. And this exact same theorem holds for if D is less than N for the distance at a function, except the residue at D for the N minus D times the average mean of the Okay, so let me skip everything. Let me just go to the and but I'll give a couple of examples. So, well, maybe just let's go focus on this example. So, this is a, a, a curve that has a cusp at the origin. Alpha is assumed to be greater than one, and you are looking at what is below the curve and above the x-axis. And uh, in that case, the dimension is one minus alpha, which is negative. Which is kind of strange. So, you have a dimension which is negative. Uh, but it's a dimension of a relative fractal plan. A is basically the, the, the curve, or the set under the curve, and omega is uh, given by this. I did not define the notion of relative fractal drum yet. Okay. And in, what is interesting is in this case, the dimension can become negative. You can even make this cusp like it using an exponential, uh, so that the dimension is minus infinity. So you have this notion of dimension which become many. And let me point out, yes, so let me define very briefly what it means to be uh, a quasi-periodic function. So you have a function which is uh, periodic, so it's a function of n variables or infinity many variables. I'm actually more interested in the infinite number of variables. And you assume that it's periodic with different period in each variable. And uh, the inter one of the interesting case is when this period, this quasi-period, TJs, are algebraically independent. So independent of the ring of algebraic numbers. Then I will call, the, in that case, I will say that the set, when the periods, the quasi-periods are algebraically independent, I'll say the object that G is transcendently quasi-periodic. So let's assume that my, so, if the volume of the T neighborhood is of the same form as before, but now with G transcendently <coughs> quasi periodic, I'll say that A is transcendently quasi periodic, the bounded set of the relative factor term. And uh, 
what we do is here we construct using a various theorem from transcendental numbers theory, in particular Roth theorem, uh, a, a relative fractal drum or a bounded fractal or a bounded set or a fractal string, uh, such that uh, it, it is transcendentally quasi-periodic. And we show that in this case, the, the line real part of S equals D with this domain class two dimension, and this will be at the end of my talk, uh, is, a, is a natural boundary for the, for the zeta function, for the distance zeta function, or the cube zeta function, if you're using. And so in other words, you have, it, in fact, it consists exactly only of singularities of the distance zeta function. That's what I expect to be true also in the random state, in many situations. Uh, so in other words, you have infinitely many singularities. In fact, it's a continuum of singularities. It's the whole vertical line real part of S equals D. It's the, the worst possible case, if you want. But this is what I call maximally hyperfractal, because you have all these singularities, of course, are non real except maybe one, at least. But everything else, I mean, I don't know. All the principles. So, so the, I'm not saying that it's always happening, but the random objects are extremely important in nature and in, in, the, in the fine fractal geometry. And I, I do think that this is what is going to happen for many random objects. It might not be the, the worst case, real part of S equals D, but it might be along the vertical line of lower dimension, or it might be a curve. But so now, and I, this will be my conclusion, I, I'm uh, thinking about developing a theory of uh, Riemann, I mean, using the theory of Riemann surfaces, developing a theory of scales in this complex, where uh, singularities of the complex dimension, I mean, singularities of the zeta function, will not necessarily be forced, and the nature of the singularity will be quite determine the type of Riemann surface you want to study, you want to use in order to understand the, the oscillations intrinsic to the object. But we already have a number, well, several examples, classes of examples, I'm writing a paper on that, where you can see that the singularities, which are not necessarily false, like essential singularities, for instance, do, it, do contribute to the geometry, and uh, in particular to the formula, the, is a, what I call fractal tube formulas which express the volume of the epsilon neighborhood in terms of the singularity or what I call complex dimension in the two one sets. So, uh, and I think, well, anyway, uh, that's that's up. Thank you. <coughs>
but uh, yeah, I mean, applications, so there, there are a number of people who are using it, so, but I would spend too much time answering those questions. But uh, for example, you, you have a much more intimate understanding of the, the, the expansions of volume of AT. Before we never had such foreigners. Uh, the counting function associated with various fractals, with the fractals. Uh, you can express them and they similarly to the complex dimensions. So all these quantities for which people were saying, well, it kind of looks like it's behaving like that approximately and so on, now you, you have a little much more precise ex expansion. Now there are there is one situation that has not taken into account here in this theory is this notion of Stokes line. So you have like exponential, small exponential things. And I would like for a future student to look at that. I mean, it's been trying to convince a student, but it's a little hard. But the, that would be very interesting to see. Because the theory of um, asymptotics, uh, the, the semi-classical asymptotics, and you know, the kind of Feynman integrals and so on. So it, it provides a general framework for understanding a lot of phenomena which were loosely understood before. But there's still a lot of so it's a new layer of information. That it gives a lot more information and also maybe understanding of what really a fractal is. I mean, you may disagree with the definition I'm giving, but I think it gives a much more precise understanding of what it means to be a fractal. Because half of dimension strictly greater than topological, it means nothing to me. And in fact, there was a counter example in the first piece of the, the book, of, I mean, the, not the first, but any matter about knew it, I mean, we were very close friends. This was always a touchy subject when we talked about it. <laughs> so we tried to avoid it. But we did talk about it. So, I have a question. Yes. So as I understand, uh, complex dimensions are, um, you have partly developed this theory uh, as an approach to the Riemann hypothesis. Yes, yeah. I was, uh, so yeah, I didn't talk I'm about wondering that about uh, what is the crux of the matter there, like uh, where are you at currently in oh, that yeah. effort, and uh, All right. like, what would be the next main step that you see that would be important? All right, so there, there is a book I mentioned at the beginning when I said my daughter got sick two years ago, very young. And, uh, and that book is about a theory of what I call fractal cohomology. I had this idea a long time ago, in 1996. I was at IHS for a year at that time. And I remember when I saw the formula, I cried. And then I lost my voice the next day. But I had not slept for six months. So I was developing the beginning of the theory. And so uh, that is, I think, an important step to so recently, with a former student of mine, Tim Kobler, we did we constructed um, um, what I call a generalized polya Hilbert operator. So an operator whose spectrum is exactly the set of complex dimensions. Now, of course, people have been looking for such operator for a long time, and I'm not saying that's the answer because it doesn't have a physical meaning, and that's really missing. That uh, I admit. But on the other hand, it provides a general framework to understand these complex dimensional spectra of certain operators. So I, I, I can give you any discrete subset of the complex plane, and uh, even a, take a continuum set, subset, and then view it as the spectrum of a certain operator. And the construction is not so simple. And then we recover the zeta function, the various meromorphic function, like the Riemann zeta function, the completed Riemann zeta function, and so on, as or the, all the L functions and many others, as a spectral determinant, as a determinant, rather, of that uh, a, a generalized determinant, more general than Frederick determinant, of this, uh, this operator. <clears throat> when of the operator, what I call the Frobenius operator, restricted to the eigenspaces, the, the total eigenspace of that. So I think that's an important step, <coughs> even though it doesn't solve Riemann at all. But it kind of resolves certain analytics uh, problems that people had before. But also it provides a theory of fractal cohomology that is to each 
complex dimension, you can associate a Hilbert space, which has the same dimension as the multiplicity as that complex dimension, as a whole, all the Zabrowski. And, and then the total cohomology space is the direct sum of all these spaces. So now you have uh, cohomology spaces which are no longer indexed just by integers, but by all the complex dimensions, or the real part if you want to take a grading in the real axis. So that's another, so that's what the group is developing, that I'm finishing. And then we have written another book which is going to appear in a few weeks, which I will offer to my father if it's dedicated to him next week for his birthday. And they very hope they have some. You should go. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, 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 ye